So you probably don't realize this yet, but we need a lot more scientists from developing nations. And let me tell you why. This is Mohamed Ba'aba. He was a teacher in Nigeria from a family of clay pot makers. Now in rural Nigeria, one of the problems is lack of refrigeration. This is because there isn't electricity. But Ba'aba had studied chemistry, and he understood a concept called heat capacity. This is the ability for materials to hold heat. So he designed a refrigerator. It's called a pot in pot. There's a smaller pot stacked inside a larger pot, and sand is in between. And then you put water on the sand, because water has a high heat capacity. It can hold a lot of heat. And the food is placed in the inner pot, and the heat transfers away from the food into the wet sand. If the water evaporates, you can add more water. So Ba'aba solves a major problem for merchants and markets, or vegetables and fruits like tomatoes, that would normally stay two to three days fresh in this kind of climate, now are fresh for two to three weeks. But Ba'aba does more. He creates jobs for clay pot makers in five manufacturing sites in remote villages. And more girls go to school instead of going to market every day to buy or to sell the perishable foods for their families. So we need more Muhammad Ba'avas who understand science and can solve real world problems and create jobs. Where are they? If poorer countries had as many chemists per capita as richer countries, how many more chemists would there be in the world? Would it be tens of thousands? Hundreds of thousands? How about millions? 1.7 million. That's how many more chemists there would be. And these could be the Einsteins of India and the Curies of Africa. Right? They could solve local and global problems with innovative solutions. So about five years ago, I was in a high school chemistry class in Uganda. And I learned something surprising. Ugandan students study a lot of chemistry. They're expected to take four to six years. That's compared to in the US where there's only one to two. Only 2013, though, only one student declared chemistry as his major at Makerere University. This is the largest university in East Africa. It has a student enrollment of 40,000. And the chemistry department has all the courses. So why not more chemistry majors? Okay. And I know what you're thinking. Because it's chemistry, right? <laughs> yeah, what's the first thing people say when I start talking chemistry to them? It's groans and rolled eyes, and I'm not just referring to my students. But it can't be the subject alone. BYU, where I teach, is smaller than my Canada. And we have 100 times more chemistry majors. So here's what I believe. Students are more likely to pursue science if it's taught in real, interactive, and engaging ways. Too often times, it's taught abstract and with rote memorization. So this is why I've devoted time the last few summers in Uganda training teachers how to incorporate more experiments to make the chemistry come alive. Now, the international community is very interested in education in developing nations. There has been a push, probably the main goal, to increase the number of students in school. The United Nations Millennial Project is pushing for free, universal primary education. And it's been great. Over the last 50 years, the attendance of kids from low-income countries has increased from about two years to seven years on average. But what if attendance doesn't equate with learning? Uwezo is a Swahili word. That means capability. It's also the name of the education arm of an NGO in East Africa. And about five years ago, they tried to do a really impossible task. Aided by citizen volunteers, they assessed the learning of 343,000 students in over 10,000 schools in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And here's what they learned. This is from 2012. They gave grade three students a grade two test. About 29% could pass the math portion, and about 25% could pass the reading. And these weren't the same students. Only about 16% could pass both the math and the reading portions. They also gave the grade two test to grade seven students, and about 20% of them still couldn't pass it. Now, this is not unique to East Africa. Dr. Lant Pridget, who's a 
leading development economist at Harvard, has done similar work in India. They assessed over a half a million kids. In a recent book, The Rebirth of Education, Schooling Ain't Learning, Dr. Pritchett writes that if the learning curve is shallow, right, if real learning's not happening in the school, then in some ways it doesn't matter how many years you stay. You could probably imagine that the pass rates in science education are also rather dismal. In Uganda, about 40% of the students in the urban areas pass the national chemistry exam, and in the rural areas, it's less than 2%. Remember, this is after four to six years of chemistry. Now, some of this is the challenges like inputs. For example, in Kampala, there aren't enough chemistry teachers. It's not uncommon for a high school class to have over 100 students in chemistry. But this can't explain everything. Teachers and schools and governments are aware of these challenges, and they've spent a lot of energy and money trying to fix them hiring more teachers, getting textbooks and computers, repairing schools. And international organizations still only find about a 10% increase in learning tied to these kinds of inputs. That is not going to make up the deficit that Uwezo and others are finding, which brings us to the teaching itself. Right? The biggest problem I see in Uganda is the outdated teaching methods. So the teacher writes on the board and the students copy in their notebook and they memorize those facts and they regurgitate them on the exam. I talked to a group of girls who were coming out of their chemistry test. They told me that the questions on the exam were exactly the same questions they had received the answers to in class. This is a colonial right style of rote memorization, not conceptual understanding. The students are experiencing little or none of the process that a chemist uses in her field. No experimentation, no prediction, right? None of this exploration. And where is the curiosity in all this? Right? Curiosity is like this key element to scientific discovery. Ian Leslie, in his book Curious, writes, the society that believes in progress, innovation, and creativity will cultivate curiosity, recognizing that the inquiring minds of its people are its most valuable assets. It is not enough for a student to memorize chemistry. It has to inspire them, it has to make them curious. So, I need you to fire up your curiosity because we're going to do an experiment. Hey, this is on that concept of heat capacity that Muhammad Ba'aba understood. So, this is the ability for materials to hold heat, and water can hold a lot of heat. So, we're going to do it as a video because somebody wouldn't let this woman bring fire in here. <laughs> right? I've got two beakers. One has alcohol in it, and one has water. Now, you know that paper burns, you probably know that paper soaked in alcohol burns really well. That's a nice play, right? Hey, you also know, or probably know, that paper soaked in water doesn't burn. So let's do that one next. Will it light on fire? Hey, great, we predict. Now here, predict again. What will happen if I soak the paper in a 50-50 mixture of alcohol and water? Will the paper burn? Okay, you have to vote, right? We're voting by raising hands, okay? Everyone who thinks the paper will burn, raise your hand. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, who thinks the paper will not burn? Okay, a few more. Who didn't vote? Yeah, this is the US, you have to vote. Okay. Fine, who's just excited that there's gonna be fire? Okay, you can actually do this experiment with lots of different papers, and the result is the same, so I actually switched papers on you just because I thought it would be more interesting. We're going to use a $20 bill. And there's going to be a few students nervous out there because that buys a whole lot of top ramen. Okay. We're going to soak this in the thing and watch it. Yeah, did you see that flame? So those of you who are worried because you remember that burning money in the U.S. is actually still a crime. We're okay. <laughs> the abstract principle is that water has this high heat capacity. And the reality you saw is that water absorbs so much heat, it protects the paper while there's burning alcohol all around it. This is why you want your kids to play with fire in school. Because the exploration and the experimentation is what lights their minds to make connections. Now, I do want to emphasize how critical it is that we're safe in a chemistry classroom so that no one is hurt. 
But to me, that's just one more reason why the students need to understand the concept and not just memorize, so that they can predict and prevent any possibly unsafe experiment. Our goal in the last three years has been to take, bring teachers onto the university for a two-day workshop in learning chemistry through experimentation. So this is a chance for us to help them see how to incorporate experiments to make the chemistry come alive for their students. The teachers are awesome. They're incredibly bright and they're passionate about chemistry, as you can imagine, because they're still in the field. We provide experiments for them with readily available materials that are inexpensive. Um, most of them are water-based, so it doesn't generate any harmful waste and you can dispose of it down the drain. The teachers explore how to use the experiments to teach these concepts. And our main goal is just to illuminate the molecular ideas for the students so they can see the beauty and the wonder of this world of chemistry. For a lot of the students or the teachers, this is actually the first time they've been encouraged to play in the lab, and it's a lot of fun. And the results are also very hopeful. Teachers report that they include about 70% more experiments in their classrooms, and the interest in their students increases as well. One of our participants, Peter Mbata, teaches chemistry at Old Kampala High School. He did an experiment of research where he included experiments in half of his classes to see the effect with and without for his students. And he tracked student learning and reported that there was an increase both in the attitude and the aptitude of the students who did hands-on practice. We need a lot more research with randomized control trials to confirm what the effects are of hands-on experimentation for deep learning. But I believe to recover the missing chemists, we need to let students practice hands-on so that the chemistry will come alive for them. This will change their view of what the chemistry is and how they can use it to change their world. So, we need to see every person as a valuable contributor, not overlooking entire nations or segments of populations who could be solving local and global problems for all of us. Problems like cancer and global warming and clean water and lack of fuel. We can get involved. We can get involved internationally with groups like Hueso or Scientists Without Borders. We can also get involved in our own neighborhood. Right? This is a lesson for us as well. So find out how science is being taught in your local schools. We need to change the way we teach and learn science. Plutarch said that the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. So maybe even let your kids, supervised of course, play with fire. Thank you.